Good evening and a warm welcome to you all joining us online for the Legs Matter and Flen Health uh, Roundtable webinar on inclusive wound care. Um, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined tonight by friends. Um, I've got sort of, uh, Kira, Lindsay and Martin with me tonight and we're looking to try and discuss how we can elevate the patient's voice. And of course that's all about the kind of uh, World Health Safety Days message that's been going out and their agenda but also it's very key to us here at Legs Matter, because as you may have known, if you've been watching our campaign, we're doing a campaign around harm. And we've got our Legs Matter 10 point plan to tackle harm. And part of that campaign is to try and bring awareness of different events, different scenarios as lower limb and foot conditions. And tonight, of course, we'll be talking about uh, inclusive wound care, specifically with people with a learning disability. And um, so just to do a few introductions. My name's Joanne Casey, I'm co-chair of uh, Legs Matter Coalition. I'm also the professional development lead here at the Royal College of Podiatry. Um, and Kira, if I could just ask you to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, Joe. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kira Lawrence, and I am engagement lead. That's my job title. And I work for the UK leading learning disability charity, Mencap. Thanks. And I'm a person with a learning disability too. Oh, thanks, Kira. That's really great to have you here. Thanks for joining. Um, and Lindsay, if I can pass over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Cherry. I'm Associate Professor of Personalised Care at the University of Southampton. And I'm also a podiatrist, still working clinically within primary care at the moment. Thanks, Lindsay. And Martin, welcome to you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Furlong. I'm the Head of Employment Relations and Professional Support at the Royal College of Podiatry, which means I head up the trade union side and manage the team that looks after our interactions with the regulator for podiatry. And I sit on the General Council of the TUC as well. That's lovely. Thanks very much, everyone. It's really nice to, to be here with you three because actually we've had lots of chats in the past and it's just going to hopefully just be another one of those kind of tea time talks or you know that we've had over the phone about these kind of discussions really where we can just be open and honest about how we feel and what we can try and do to support uh, this campaign in, on inclusive wound care um so just a little bit of background then i guess guess about why we're all here is that um who has dedicated this year's world patient safety day to elevate the patient's voice to engage the patient-led decision-making in healthcare and compassionate leadership is dedicated to listening to what matters to patients and families as users of the health and social care system. So engaging patients in shared care, making um, decision-making around their health enables a personalized approach and might lead to help individuals identify and understand their personal responsibilities and commitment towards their health. And of course, Legs Matter has raised concerns in the systemic failures in leg and foot care and has built a campaign to uncover the hidden harm crisis and level in management. So, you know, this webinar really is to look to discuss how as clinicians in health and social care, how we can be inclusive of lower limb wound care for all service users and explore the enablers of a meaningful conversation and consultation for those living with a learning disability and how we can put reasonable adjustments, um, you know, to try and make it easier for people with a learning disability to access care and to have full involvement in their care um, and so hopefully then we can try and align this mission with the, the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, uh, which is a plan going from 2021 to 2030, where we can do more to explore these barriers of inclusive health and social care to prevent either direct or indirect harm. So we've got kind of a, a kind of set of questions that we kind of, you know, we've thought about together, haven't we? And we'd just like to kind of discuss some of those. And, I guess the biggest one at the minute is that we've just said that who recognises, so the World Health Organisation recognises that more needs to be done to support people um, and the patient's voice in health and social care systems. And I guess, Kira, you know, living with a learning disability, do you agree with that, that we need to recognise that more needs to be done to support patients? Yes, I totally agree with that. Um, now, as I said earlier, I am a person who has a learning disability. I live with a learning disability and we really need to do more to get healthcare right for people with a learning disability. There are 1.5 million people living in the UK right now with a learning disability. More babies are being born who will have a learning disability and those numbers are going up. And so we need to make sure that healthcare professionals are really getting it right for people like me, because in the past, sadly, people have died due to poor care, 
due to lack of communication, to lack of treatment, and we want to make sure that never happens again. Um, and through my career at MENCAP, I've been there 22 years, and I've done a lot of healthcare campaigning within that time. And I just want to make sure that people like me are treated equally and they get the right care to healthcare and they get the right support to healthcare. So, yes, I agree with you totally. Thank you, Kira. I mean, you just mentioned that, you know, there's been some quite serious, you know, people have passed away because of a lack of inclusivity. Yep. What, you know, what, can you just explain that a little bit more? I know you've got an example, haven't you, that we've spoken about before? Yes. So. One of the sad deaths, um, you might have heard about it in the news or you might have heard about it in online. Sadly, um, a guy called Oliver McGowan died in hospital care and it was because a healthcare professional ignored something that was on his history and on his notes and on all his health reports and they totally ignored it and they gave him um, a medication that affected him and he died in hospital care and mm. he shouldn't have had that and they gave it to him and he died and it had they taken the time to read his history to read his notes to read his records they would have gone okay we won't give him that medication and they did and so his wonderful mother Paula McGowan has been campaigning her socks off to make sure that there's good mandatory LD awareness training for all healthcare professionals that's now been rolled out it got royal assent and now all healthcare professionals will get that training and we just want to make sure everybody has it from whether they're a receptionist in the hospital to a porter in a hospital to a nurse to a doctor to a surgeon we want to make sure everybody gets that training because we don't want any more needless deaths of people with a learning disability in hospital care you wouldn't do it to someone else from a different community group so why do it to people with a learning disability mm -hmm. The impact of that has been huge, hasn't it, really, if you think about what's happened. And I guess for healthcare professionals themselves, to know that you're that you have, you know, you have harmed somebody actually has a huge impact on us as well, as well either as the families that are impacted, but as a healthcare professional, you know, we don't you know, it's not something that sits easy with us, is it? And I just you know, just bring in Lindsay, you're a healthcare professional as well. And you know, it's not something that we like to think that we would do what is it really how do you feel that the, it impacts us as healthcare professionals this idea that we potentially could be harming harming people oh gosh i mean of course not i think um, everybody working in health and social care does so with good intent they they yeah. enter into these lots of different roles whatever they might might be because there's this we're driven normally you know by this underlying um, want to to help other people um no, that's it. so i think it's it's really that it, it it's unintended harm and avoidable harms isn't it really we're focusing on yeah that's and especially if we think back to wound care specifically you know that's kind of where we're going with this today isn't it about thinking about you know trying to be inclusive around and preventing harm in wound care and I guess what, what we're thinking about here is, is there a potential that there's a hidden harm crisis in lower limb wound care management for those people with a learning disability? You know, just having listened to Kira, how people said that they didn't really listen to Oliver's family um, yeah. and the notes and things. And I, I think we've got a poll here as well. So we're going to try and ask the audience, if you're sitting at home, whether or not you might be able just to answer a question for us. And that question is, is there a potential for a hidden harm crisis in lower limb wound care management for those people with a learning disability? And while we sort of wait for your answers, what I'll just do is try and pick that one up with Lindsay. So is there a potential that there's a hidden home crisis in low and limb wound care? It, it's a really good question. So um, in, in kind of preparation for today, it, as a true academic fashion, I went away and I wanted to look at the evidence. Um, and, you know, there is some really good evidence that uh, people with a learning disability are more likely to experience unintended harm through contact with healthcare systems that haven't created reasonable adjustments in, in various different ways. But I also asked the question um, 
specifically within UK healthcare, because what we find is a lot of a lot of the data and the evidence is generated internationally. And there's quite limited evidence really exploring that question in terms of in, in the UK in particular. When I narrowed the field down and I and I really wanted to ask, what do we know about the prevalence of lower limb wounds, for example, in people who might be living with learning disability? And what do we know about potential harms or unintended consequences of treatment? We find that there's no evidence or certainly I couldn't find any evidence at all that would help us answer that question. And therefore, we just don't know from an mm. academic perspective we can't answer that question so that would lead me to say do I agree that there's potential hidden harm the answer would be yes because we can't evidence any other way mm. and I can see here from our um our lovely listeners at home that's actually 95 percent of you have actually said yes they've completely agreed with that that they do think there's a potential for a hidden harm crisis and some have said, I don't know. And I guess, again, going with what you've just said, Lindsay, the don't know is quite right, because we actually don't know. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, Kira, how does that make you feel that we haven't actually researched this? You know, we haven't really looked into this, you know, for, for people living with a learning disability. We're, we're healthcare professionals. We say that we are inclusive and we, tr you know, we're trying to be inclusive and we're managing wounds. We know that people... Um, you know, with a low disability, you know, can develop type 2 diabetes. We know type 2 diabetes leads to, uh, you know, pressure damage on the feet can lead to ulceration. That can lead to amputation. But yet we don't, we haven't unpicked what, you know, who, who develops that. So how does that make, how does it make you feel, Kira, you know, and, and from your main cap sort of hat on? Yeah. Um, we know that it's just people don't know what a learning disability is people don't know sometimes how to talk to somebody with a learning disability that they might be treating they might be scared of them they might not have the right resources and tools to support them in their treatment um and now you know it's really important now that we've got the learning disability register which everybody can now sign up for so if you have a learning disability please go and get on the ld register the learning disability register you can sign up with your gp and that means you will be flagged so every time you go and see your doctor or have a health appointment it will flash up that you have a learning disability and they will need to know that you need extra time and extra reasonable adjustment adjustments and that will show that you've got a learning disability so we really are about making sure we're educating people in learning disability awareness and that we're making sure that healthcare professionals get it right because we want to be treated right um, and it's up to people like me who have a learning disability to tell our story and be listened to and say actually if you listen to my experience, you'll make things better. So, you know, through MENCAP, we know that there's a lot more to do, but we have started that journey. And hopefully, you know, we can work even more with healthcare professionals, you know, more with the government and make sure the training's in place for everybody. So, yeah, I'd say through education and training and awareness, we can make things better. But it also makes me feel sad that you know for a long time healthcare healthcare professionals don't really know and that's not their fault that's not deliberate that they don't know and i'm not blaming anyone i'm not pointing fingers but you know i think people just don't know about learning disability they don't know what a learning disability is so i'm going to do a quick ld test just to see how much people know um so a learning disability is a condition that starts just before birth during birth and after birth it's lifelong it has no cure so you can't take medicine for a learning disability it does not work that way believe me Basically, you will have your learning disability all the way through your life from when you're born to when you die. It doesn't go away. You have it your whole life. So a learning disability affects the way people learn. It affects the way someone communicates and someone understands information. So every day in our lives, we face barriers like hard accessible information. If I'm handed a letter that I don't understand, don't 
don't expect me to reply to it because then I need somebody to explain it to me. Whereas actually, if people made easy read letters and accessible letters, I could respond, I could reply and say, yes, I understand what you're telling me. But this world does not fit people like me. And actually, people need to make reasonable adjustments so that I can fit into this world. Um, and, you know, I'm very social model. I'm not the problem. The problem is the world and they need to change. So mm. I'm very social model of learning disability. I'm not medical model. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I get very angry when I hear that people with a learning disability have been treated badly because it's down to ignorance. It's down to lack of awareness. It's down to lack of education. And that's why I'm here to say, please come and talk to people like me, because I can tell you about my experience and I can help you change it. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, Kira. I mean, Martin, I can just see there that, you know, with the reasonable adjustments that Kira was talking about, you know, what sort of things can be made? She's put that social model as well. And I know this is all the things that you've been working on, you know, with the um, in your role at the Royal College. You just expand on that a little bit about how we can make these reasonable adjustments and what's there to support people with a learning disability. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and there's a whole load of what Kira said there that I can absolutely completely agree. And the whole issue of the, the social model, for example, is a good place to start because if uh, the, the, the medical model that uh, Kira mentioned is saying that if you have a learning disability, you are the problem, whereas the social model is saying what it what the problem is that the barriers put in people's way to stop them being able to do something. And if I just give you an example, if you're left-handed and you turn up at a golf club and decide you want to learn how to play golf, they'll hand you a set of golf clubs. If you turn up and say left-handed golf clubs, if you, if you turn up and say you've got a learning disability, they probably wouldn't know what to do with you. But what they should be doing is putting something in place to help you do that and to work with you. And the whole thing about um, reasonable adjustments, it, it's it's a legal term. It's in the Equalities Act, uh, which talks about uh, people's responsibilities. And probably everybody on this call uh, is covered by the, the Equality Act as service providers to people like Kira. Um, and what that's, that says you need to make reasonable adjustments for people who have uh, disabilities and particularly learning disabilities. So there's a couple of points that have already been made uh, about what you can do about reasonable adjustments. But I would say the first thing to do all, all the time is two two Quick points. One, always read those notes because there will be something in the medical notes that's, that uh, you need to, to know and always keep a record of what you've done. Uh, two of the biggest things that uh, people end up in front of regulators from generally and therefore end up talking to people like me is because they haven't read the notes or because they haven't kept their own notes properly. So that's really important to, to do that. So what, what the reasonable adjustments you can make are to understand that somebody coming to see you who has a learning disability will behave in a different way to somebody who doesn't. Uh, somebody who doesn't turn up, you say, I'm going to uh, put a bandage on a wound. The chances are they'll just say, okay, that's fine. Somebody with a learning disability, depending on what it is, if it's ADHD, dyslexia, et cetera, et cetera, may want to ask more questions. They may want to know more about what you're doing that they want to explain to them it, it, quite a, a lot so they understand it i think kira just made the point about how you get that information so just be patient it, it is, is a reasonable adjustment and uh answering the questions is a reasonable adjustment but recording what you've done and if you record what you've done it makes it easier for the next person who sees that that you this is how to do you do do with that the reasonable adjustments i would say everybody can make is do a bit of a research research into things like Tourette's it's a very different sort of learning disability to ADHD for example uh, and it's there it is yeah, it's people who talk a lot etc so it, understand what it is so the reasonable adjustments are to make sure you know what that person needs to make them break down those barriers so they that the social model of, of caring will actually help that person and the biggest reason adjustment you can make is put yourself in their shoes and think, what would I want to ask if I was in that position? Um, and it's like people talk about risk assessments in health and safety and reasonable adjustments and they're, they're legal terms. But all you need to do really, is be sensible, take your time, 
think about it from their point of view and be patient with the person who's there who has that problem and give them the good health care they deserve. Thanks, Matt. I mean, just I'm just going to bring this back a little bit because I'm just thinking about when I treat patients as a podiatrist, you know, that have got wound care problems and, you know, or, or they've got a wound on their toe or I might have an ingrown toenail and, you know, there's a wound there. And I'm just thinking, and Lindsay, you probably have the same sort of experiences as me. You have to, There is definitely a, a way in which you have to make considerations, isn't there, in clinic? I mean, I'm just thinking about the time element, you know, to try and offer more time. I mean, the, the height and pace sensation sometimes can be a problem. They're not knowing what's going to happen, the tools that we use. I mean, when we think about what we, how we would normally deliver wound care, what what adjustments can we can we can we make you know what do you and then the other thing I'm just thinking here again is time is such a big factor in wound care you know but as soon as we've got a patient in this it's so multifactorial isn't it you know when we're thinking about offloading the pressure we're thinking about cleaning the wound we're thinking about educating and supporting the patient with you know we're thinking about then possibly off um, antibiotics x-rays you know all of these other diagnostics as podiatrists to try and manage the wound and then, of course, with that, we've also got someone with a learning requirement and having the capacity within our, our day sometimes doesn't seem that it's manageable. But yet we've got to find these adjustments. I mean, if we're sort of thinking back at how we manage a service, like how do we how do we sort of how do we do it? I mean, yeah, I think. I, and I'm just to acknowledge a comment in the chat about slowing down our talking speed. Um, I think if we take it back a little bit, it, it's how we adjust our consultations for everybody. Um, and there will be some particular um, adjustments that we might make for people with a learning disability, but actually everybody wants to have a personalised consultation and feel like their healthcare is tailored to them. And that's where I think um, we can learn a lot from the model of personalised care and the personalised care framework that's out there. For folks who perhaps aren't familiar with that, I would direct you to somewhere called the Personalised Care Institute and their website, where there's huge amounts of resource available. And it sets out six in the UK, at least six key areas of focus where the way that we organize healthcare is being changed. Personalized care framework is part of the NHS long-term plan and therefore is part of our workforce planning and how if you are part of a, a systems leadership team, you need to think about structuring your consultations at, at scale. But actually, if you look at the evidence base for personalised care, there's, some, there's a really interesting piece of research from the Health Foundation where they looked at 9,000 consultations and where a personalised care approach was adopted, there was increased confidence to self-manage, improved understanding and inclusion in shared decision making. And that led to an 18% reduction in GP consultations but massively a 38% reduction in contacts with an emergency department. Now, we don't know what that data would look like for people with a learning disability, because obviously nobody's done the research, we can't tell you. But if we just look at everybody, that's, that's a 38% reduction in avoidable harm and healthcare utilisation. So actually, there's something about us stepping back from feeling like we have a lot of busy work to engage with, but recognising the consultation itself is an important part of what happens within an episode of wound care beyond the physical treatment skill. Mm -hmm. And I think that reframing is something that's really, really important. And there is absolutely this growing body of evidence to reinforce that how we think of harm and what harm is and what risk is and who owns that risk and then how we share concepts of risk and include people in a consultation conversation is really, really important. 
and could significantly reduce harm. So is that not something that we should be doing and giving equal weight to? Yes, and um, we, we did have another poll question actually that was just coming out was, do we think patients want to be involved in their care? And I, I guess if that poll can go out and, and Kira, do you want to be involved in your care? I'll just put the question. Yeah. Yes. Um, and actually this leads me on to a really good experience that I had last year. So last year, I finally got on my GP learning disability register after three years of campaigning to get on it. Three years, can I say? I literally was like, I can be on it. I know I want to be on it. I know about it. Please put me on it. And my GP was like, nah, no, sorry. Uh -uh. And my mum and I literally went to town and we lobbied and we went, do you know what? We'll go to the NHS Surrey Trust then. And then they finally put me on. And we were like, we shouldn't have had to go that far to get on it. And actually now I'm on it. And last year I had my very first learning disability annual health check, which I should have had three years ago. And also they really listened to me they listened to my needs. They listened to the support that I needed for that appointment. But also what was great was they said part of the appointment in the annual health check is having a blood test. And I was like, no, 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 no. I, I don't do needles. No, sorry, you're not going there. And they were like, why you know is there an issue and I said look I'm need I have needle phobia I don't like needles I'm scared of needles you know I I've been able to have my COVID vaccinations with really good support with my family they go with me support me so I've had all those so far and I've been <laughs> excuse me I've been fine because I've had support from them to have it done but with blood tests I was like no way am I having it done so what they did is they said to tell you what, why don't we do it another day? Let's think about it today. Let's chat through it just for today. Let's just work out what you need for that appointment so we can do it safely, but also you get your reasonable adjustment as well. And I was like, perfect. So what we did is we booked it for like two weeks later and they prescribed me numbing cream before my appointment because they said, what we can do is we can bring you in an hour before the test. We can put the numbing cream like up and down your arms of where it's going to be. And then you'll feel nothing. And so I went in, had the first appointment that morning. They put the nut cream on. They put a wrapping over it. I went and sat in the cafe for like 45, 50 minutes to kind of to let it kick in. Then I went back and I had the test done and I felt nothing. And actually for me, I was like, I can finally crack my needle phobia because I've had someone listen to me. I've had someone give me the support that I needed to have it done. And I walked out that appointment, instead of having a bit of a cry and a bit of a meltdown, I left there smiling because I knew actually in the future, I know I'm, I'm allowed to ask for and I know what support I can have. So yeah, it's it's really important that, you know, people with a learning disability get on that LD register with their GP because believe me, it means then they can get the health care that they deserve, they get the support they deserve, they get the equal treatment they deserve. And I've had to fight for mine and now I've had it and I've been given the right support finally and now my GP won't leave me alone they won't stop pestering me now so you know it's brilliant so you know I'm very gobby I am very opinionated I call a spade a spade and I'm not just talking up for me I'm talking up for the 1.5 million people in the UK with a learning disability who aren't heard like I am who don't have a voice like I have and it's really important to me that they get heard too so that's why I'm here to say, please, as health professionals, listen to people like me because I can educate you. Thanks, thanks, Kira. So, the, so the answer, so yes, you definitely want to be involved in your healthcare. Then, and so yes. Lindsay, you're dead right. That you know, it, it sounds like from what Kira's saying, you know, in her in her role, man, and her personal yeah, opinion as well. But, but actually, but what's really interesting, Joe, is when you, we look at the the poll results. It, yeah, and I love 
folks on honesty here because I think it's I'm not sure how I would necessarily respond to whether it would be the same each day because I I come into clinic I'm a person under pressure under stress sometimes and I fully acknowledge that we're all working in challenging situations and I aspire to be awesome in every consultation of course in reality am I no sometimes I am making decisions and and kind of holding risk and thinking actually that really looks infected I really think we just need to do this right now and and there's there is probably a a, a sliding scale in my own mind sometimes of how do I really really you know I know what the evidence says and I know all of this stuff but I think the reality in clinic is that this stuff is challenging to do and, and I think yeah it is the poll reflects that doesn't it it is challenging so I guess how do we open up the conversations then to sort of try and embrace this as clinicians how do we open up that conversation ourselves how do we engage the, the patient into you know really trying to be part of their wound care decisions you know yeah. how, what, what can we do there's some there's some absolutely fantastic training available free to health and social care professionals through the personalized care institute and in particular i would say have a look at the training around shared decision making and these are lovely examples of simulated consultations where you can log on and you can have a go at practicing different responses in a con in a consultation and learn through experience um, and and that's quite powerful we all learn differently so it's a different mm. way of, for us as healthcare professionals to learn um, and I think sharing and observing each other's practice is also really important taking time to learn about consultation models being open to peer review and other people observing your consultation is really really important and, and powerful as that's well. quite scary isn't it peer review I mean it's definitely what we need to be doing but it really does sort of make you worried about everything that you do but it has to be a safe space isn't it that you're with your colleagues you're both learning each other that in um part of our you know development of ourselves so it can be written as a reflective piece for gaining points in your cpd that you've done this peer review system so it's actually probably quite important to do for any way but it's it is a bit of a scary thought isn't it to have someone watch over your shoulder but actually if it's for the better of the patient and better for our care and by the sounds of it better for the system because you're saying more people engaged and they didn't have that many people coming back into the a and e so it's yeah, and I think what, what I would say to anyone who feels really nervous about that is that we're all learning and I guess to make you feel reassured the concepts of personalised care, the pillars of personalised care, these, these are relatively new concepts that are emerging. The training is new, you know, lots of this only came online last year. So everybody's in the same boat that we might have different innate skill levels, we might have different starting points everybody is needing to learn this as as new skills everybody's constantly having to develop and adjust and we're all on that journey and the whole concept really and as soon as you start being open to this actually every consultation is a learning opportunity where when you're both in the room you and the person that you're working with they're giving you feedback in real time about how good your consultation is because it becomes a two-way conversation and that's when you're you know that you're starting to to get it to work yeah that's it is just sort of, sort of taking that deep breath and having faith in yourself because you probably as we've said before none of us try to go out to deliver harm it's more something that maybe is something that's we, we're not aware of um, and so learning from, you know, listening to people like Kira that have sort of said, actually, just I want to be part of this. This is what I need. I need a bit of extra time. Knowing then, of course, that there is support out there. And Martin, there is what support is out there in practice to you know, help with the accountability for healthcare professionals in the treatment and management of lower limb wound care, for people with learning disability. I mean, there is stuff out there, isn't there, to support us. And the stuff out there also to sort of support Kira. Um, what, what's out there? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there is a lot of support out there. And I'm going to take on board the point about speaking a bit slower and apologies for me. I, I'm, a, I'm used to shouting into microphones, so I'll try and keep it slow. Um, the, the, the places to go to for support are your professional body is a good place to start. Um, if you contact someone like us at the Royal College of Podiatry and we don't have enough on there already, tell us, make us do it. Uh, this is, as Lindsay said, this is all very new. We have to respond to that. Like the you know, Royal College of Nursing, except all those other bodies will all, will all have uh, bits that you can use for support. Um, but there's also other support from all the regulators themselves on the HCPC website, for example, where they've got their new standards about uh, uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion. There is a lot of information on there. There's the five-year plan on the the, the, uh, the, NER, the, the NMC uh, website as well. That's always worth looking at too. So the stuff is out there. If you go finding it, uh, if you find good good uh, providers of education, please let play people like us know because we can signpost people to it. And there's all sorts of bits that you, you can try and do yourself. Um, I think Caroline made a really good point in the chat earlier about um, every time you speak to somebody who has a learning disability, it's going to be a different conversation because people are in different places along that route. Uh, and think you're always going to be learning and the best learning is to do it. Uh, we've kind of been a bit scary saying that, you know, you, you know, oh, it is scary dealing with people learning disabilities. But once you do it and you start doing it, you start to learn and you start to realise that you're there. It's the best place. But the best place to learn, I would su suggest, is by making sure that when you see a patient, you make those proper notes so that the next healthcare professional who comes along and looks at those notes is going to do your learning will help them. That's where they'll learn. Mm. And probably one of the best places to learn is when the patient is sitting there in front of you, you're looking at doing some wound care, ask them. They'll, they'll, if you ask the right questions, they'll tell you. Uh, mm. I know there's, there's been points made in the chat about people who are, are they able to make decisions. And say, so that's a slightly different thing to talk about. I'm sure we can come on to that. But generally speaking, people who've got a learning disability are able to tell you about it. You'll learn from them and learn from your colleagues. Um, it, it's a never-ending uh, journey to learn about what you want to do uh, and just keep on doing it and share it with other people as well. Once you've learned something, share it. Share it mm -hmm. with your professional body, share it with your colleagues, because that's how we all learn. I was just sitting, I'm curious, curious when we've had discussions before, you've told me a little bit about mild moderate and sort of severe yeah. you know le levels of learning disability and of course just yeah. listening to sort of martin say you know there is you know ask the questions and in in connex we'll come across you know people, you said you came in with your mum to your appointment you took somebody with you yeah. you know how, how do we how do we communicate then with people that have got you know a moderate or a severe learning disability what what kind of things as healthcare professionals can we do to support support them because you know a wound is the wound is always going to be on the patient's foot so we have to communicate in some way don't we to or, or lower limb um with the yeah. patient but equally um, we often aren't the best person to communicate because they're often they've got more um you know they've got they've got more of a bond with the potential you know next of kin or care of parents um family member what would be you know what what would you say for people with more of a severe, you know, moderate or severe learning disability? How would we work with them? So everybody's different. Everybody, every person with a learning disability is different. They will talk to you in a different way. They'll communicate with you in a different way. So it might be that easy read might not fit everybody. It might be learning Makaton. It might be making a video, it might be using pictures, it might be using symbols, it might be using subjects, it might be using items, it might be using, you know, sensory toys or sensory items. So it's about getting to know that person. So mm. now, if I have to go to an appointment on my own, I always have my sensory item because that item makes me feel more comfortable. I can have it in my hand. I can be using it. I can kind of have it on me. And it's just that kind of 
you know if i if i need to get it out and use it i will and it's that's my reasonable adjustment um and i i use it for my dentist appointments because i hate going to the dentist so whenever i'm in the chair i always have my sensory items on me because for me that's how i cope and that i like to have something that i can touch and use and kind of that's my reasonable adjustment and it helps me to communicate um but everybody's different. So it could be using Macton, it could be using an object, it could be using Easy Read, but everybody's different. Um, it's about seeing the person in front of you, listening to them, take their lead, take your time, you know, give them a double time appointment so you've got extra time. Um, no rushing then, that's so much better now. Um, if you have a double time appointment, I have those now and it means I can understand information. I can have someone in the room with me to help un help me understand and help support me. I can have a double time appointment, which means we have lots of time and I can ask questions. I can talk and say, sorry, I don't understand. Can you repeat or can you make that more clearer? But not everybody's vocal as I am. So it might be that you might think actually this person can't speak this person can't communicate but actually it's about thinking actually if i'd read their notes if i'd read their history if i'd taken the time to learn about them before i see them then i could adapt my language i could adapt what i do and how i talk to them and how i work with them um so my gp now he says to me when i'm coming for an appointment he knows that i need you know to be spoken to in a really clear way and now he uses easy words when i go and see him when i'm talking to him um sensory items objects pictures makaton there's all different ways you could think of you know treating someone um and having someone in the room under reasonable adjustments i know that you can have someone in the room with you to support you like a pet parent or a support worker or a carer that's always so important because you know if I didn't understand something and there's a person in the room with me who does they can then explain it to me and then I go ah okay now I've got you now I shouldn't have to have that but I have to have that and actually it shows again the health professionals lack of understanding but now that I'm on the LD register, they know that they have to make those reasonable adjustments. And they know that I will say something. If they don't, I will give them a rollicking. Um, <laughs> but everybody's different. My needs are totally different to Joe next door. Joe next door has totally different needs to Mary next door. And we are all different. One, mm. one size fits all does not fit all. It's about seeing the individual as a person and going, right, how can I do this really well? And it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay, we're all human. But just as long as you learn from that mistake and don't do it again and learn from it, that's yeah. okay. We all make mistakes and we all have to learn from them sometimes. But it's just about, it's education, it's training, it's awareness. And actually, you know, I, I have so many friends who have mild and moderate and I now know when I'm out with them as friends, I have to adapt my language, I have to adapt my timetable, I have to adapt how I cope, I have to adapt what I would do if something went wrong and sometimes it does and we have to kind of work things out and that's okay but you know not, every, not everybody's the same and everybody will need something different. Um, you know, I know that I've been to meetings with my friend who has autism and if she gets the wrong end of the stick about things, she has a meltdown. So it's about saying, actually, I can explain it to her, but I just need two minutes to explain that thing to her and then she'll be OK. But people just go, oh, oh, oh my God, like, like, what have I done? And actually, if they had been clear from the word go, she would be fine. But it's again, you know, everybody's different. Everybody has their own needs and everybody's individual. It's just about knowing the person in front of you, taking the time to read their history, to read their notes, to read their records and go, right, this is how I support that person.
It's interesting that you use the, we use the word language because I was I've just been looking up the best practice statement uh, personalized care for people with venous leg ulcers a toolkit for change came out this year and one of the things they say in there they've got a dialogue tool and they sort of say they try to avoid jargon and language that infers prejudice or attributes blame and makes an effort to use person centered language that is collaborative and engaging and using jargon it's so easy isn't it Lindsay for us as healthcare professionals to slip into that sort of language. You know, yeah, what do you, think, how do you try and avoid that? I think it's, some of it's about, this is education and training for us, isn't it, as health professionals. And once you try, it's a new skill, isn't it? Approaching consultations in a different way. So you're not gonna get it right the first time that you try a skill, but with, with practice, you get, better at it that I notice in the chat there's a, a lovely comment from Melanie as well um, where she's noticing that you know in an inpatient unit they're really conscious of time um, and that trying to ac access um, various team support can be really difficult but I think the other thing that I've really noticed as I've been working in personalised care is that it's not always about the volume of inf there's a volume of information that we feel we need to share and we think that we need to share as healthcare professionals and there's a volume of work that we think needs doing but actually the volume could be reduced at times so it's thinking really really calmly and slowing it down to to streamline the volume of information that we need to care and also noticing pauses and creating space for pausing. And I think there's something important about allowing space in conversations for people to hear the message, think about what, what they've just heard, interpret it, form a response, work out how to articulate a question and then arrive at a question. And as well as jargon, I think what we also do is interrupt people in that process of communication. We don't allow the pauses. And the people who I often am more concerned about are the people that seem to have given up trying to communicate, who are extremely quiet. And as healthcare professionals, we might think they're incredibly adherent, but really we, it means we probably don't really know what's going on for them. So I absolutely appreciate the, the time pressures, but at, in, at times creating space with nothing in is really, really important, just as much as having space to do stuff in. So if... If we sort of take it, I'm just trying to picture here, you know, my clinical environment, I, um, you know, my patients come in, there's a wound on their foot. What sort of thing, what kind of, how can we begin to start communicating? What would be the kind of opener? Do you have any sort of suggestions as, a, as an opener with somebody with a learning disability that, you know, just to kind of create that space? I think it's reflecting what you see as a, as a starter. So an open question of, what what do you think is going on here how are you okay and 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 listening to what comes back and then responding to what comes back rather than having a script in your mind of how you want the conversation to go because if you're following a predefined script you're in transmit mode and therefore you're not in listening mode and a consultation is there to meet the needs of the person that you are working with, not to meet your needs as the healthcare professional. And that's part of us letting go of mm. some of the tick boxes that we have, some of the things that we think we have to get through on our script. But if we're just working through a script, we might as well be shouting it out of the window. It's pointless. We're better off listening and asking an open question and and I think that's where the sh the shared decision making comes in 
where really thinking about supporting self-management, understanding the concept of activation, so somebody's readiness and ability, capability to engage with care and wound care is really important and not making any assumptions. So asking people about what do they think about their wound care plan? Do you have questions? What would they like to do at home? Yeah, and I guess it's, I'm just, we, we put up a poll question a bit earlier and we said that, um, how likely are you to follow a patient they'd review? And 53% said they were highly likely, but actually, unless we listen, we don't know, do we, what the patient actually wants? Um, and then there's sort of 33% said they, have, they, were, they were likely to try and follow a patient-led review or follow-up plan. And so it's really nice to hear that the listeners want to do that. Um, and actually, you know, that's, it's just how we go about changing the language, how we get support from a systems point of view. Um, and then I was sort of, how do we, we know that there's no research in this area. How do we go about building up that sort of, evaluations audits absolutely about I think it, it it doesn't have to be large-scale research and i think kira put it brilliantly earlier when she said she's sharing her personal story because through that you build momentum and we share our understanding case studies are really really powerful and that's a lovely place to start and again there's support for writing those whether you're a family member, carer, healthcare professional, or person trying to engage in healthcare, there's a really valuable story to share. And again, the Personalised Care Institute or academics at the University of Southampton or any of the, the folks here can help support and, and work with you to, to create those and share those. And that's the, the place to start. And from there, we, we grow our, our evidence. Base. And of course, we're always keen to include people in our research as advisors and contributors. And that's a lovely way to shape and inform the research priorities that you think, if you're seeing these gaps, work with us as academics to tell us this is really important. This is a priority for research. This is the question that you need to be asking. And through academia we have ways of channeling all of your really important questions from whichever background you're coming from directly into research pan panels and funding panels for them to review i'm just picking up i'm just wanted to try and link that into a question that karen's put in the chat here she says does anyone think that our service managers need to engage with these messages sometimes our services are directed by a lack of time and a lack of available appointments and again that's it, you know, wound care does take a long time. Those treatments, those complex decision makings that we make when we have a patient in front of us does take a lot of time. So engaging. But do you know, this, this, the classic question that comes around for me is if, if I'm talking with, say, imagine a podiatrist or a practice nurse or somebody, and you might be, be seeing a patient fortnightly or every three weeks or there's a long program to wound care often, and we have these contacts. And my question is, why is it at that pace? Why is it that schedule? When did you decide that? And what would happen if in one of those consultations, you didn't do some of the physical stuff and you did have just a conversation about how this episode of care is going. Are there any questions? How do you feel about the decisions that are being made? Are there any decisions in your treatment plan that we need to rethink? And can we spend that time in shared decision-making? And some people will say, but that feels really risky because I'm not doing this. I haven't checked the wound. And, mm. and maybe Martin, that might be one for you to come in on because for, for clinicians, there is this conflict between, but where do I stand in terms of, of risk? I have to do these things. But actually the evidence suggests that you would be better spent 
not doing some of the wound care sometimes and actually having a consultation that's personalised. I completely agree with that, Lindsay. Yeah. And I think it's important that we, as healthcare professionals, no matter where you are, make those judgments on those appointments on a clinical basis. You, know, you, you, you go in to see a patient, and if it, the best clinical decision I can make today is to spend some time talking to this patient. Uh, and if that's made as a clinical decision, places like the, the HEPC, the other regulators, will look at that and take that on board as you doing what's needed to be done uh, and, and try to do it. And as long as you record it, as long as you write the notes, the record keeping, bang on about record keeping all the time, because that's really important to do that. Uh, that's, that's perfectly fine to do that. Uh, and to go back to the question about time as well, there's, you, you, we all have to work together on this one about being able to persuade whoever it might be. If I'm talking to the NHS on behalf of trade union members or podiatrists and other healthcare professionals, we need to be making these points all the time about that. This we need to be making the points about how you educate people and do that. Uh, but also, I've kind of reflected during the discussion about um, about the way you talk to people, and it's made me think about a, a good friend of mine who uh, I see on a regular basis socially, who has Tourette's. Um, he's not going to see. You're never going to see this. So hopefully, I'm, I'm not breaking any confidences or anything like that. And there's a group of friends that he has, and we all know what his condition is. Uh, and when we're out, we make a, adjustments for him. We kind of explain if someone nearby looks in because he's talking loudly. We probably all have friends who have learning disabilities. I mean, now, because of the, the way that these things are uh, recognised more and diagnosed more, we, we have we, we, we come across this in our social lives as well, and we make those adjustments in our social lives. So we should also make them in our professional lives as well because they're there. Uh, and whenever you're seeing that patient, you're autonomous, as someone said in, in the chat, you can make those decisions about what's the best way to treat that patient in that 20 minutes, 25 minutes slot that you've got. You can make those decisions. Martin, just picking up on that, I mean, I know that you know the Disability Act. We, we're sort of really meant to be inclusive, allowing people to have their own choices, their own decisions, haven't we? Is there any sort of anything more that you can add to sort of really support the kind of legislation around this? So we're saying that you know we know this is the right thing to do, but actually, we we really do need to do the right thing. Like this really is something that's that's written that we must support people. Yeah, the, the, the legislation is really clear about uh, people who have a, a disability and about if you're aware of that disability, you, know, you have certain obligations under the law. And yeah, let, you know, try not to speak about the law too much, but it is there uh, and it has to be part of the thinking. And it's the thinking of managers, it's the thinking of the healthcare systems as how they also have responsibilities to do that. So you've that can help you because of those responsibilities that things like the Equality Act place on you as somebody who is helping a patient, uh, that gives you protection as well so that you're not putting that person at risk by making a decision. Yeah, you, you can use that legislation really easily to do it. There's some very simple guides on how that how you could use that place, like main caps we mentioned, who have will have stuff on their websites lots of other places as well. It's a really good guide to uh, disability, the, the Equality Act on the ACAS website, which just recommend have a, a Google search of that on the ACAS website. And it works both ways, the Equality Act. It, prevent, it protects the person who is on the receiving end of treatment, treatment and the person delivering it. So there's all sorts of bits that you can do with that. Uh, it'll, it'll, the legislature works two ways, Joanne. I think that really sort of tightens. I'm, I'm conscious of our time. I can't believe we've managed to chat for uh, about an hour. Um, but it's so what we're saying really is sort of sum up messages, you know, here to me, I'm listening to you know, give, give patients the time, listen, they want to be involved in their care. We need more research in this area of wound care and people with a learning disability. And the legislation is there to protect us, it's there to protect the patient. And then also we've got our responsibilities from our Health and Social Care Professions Council, but also um, other um, 
healthcare professionals have got their own legislation as well. So we just need to make the change. We just need to take action, don't we, really? We need to, to sort of move on this now to make health and social care accessible for all. And that's part of the Legs Matter 10-point plan to tackle harm. One of the things that we're saying with Legs Matter is in, in all areas of wound care is to acknowledge it as harm. So, you know, we, we, we just don't know. We've said that. We don't know that this is harm because there's no evidence. So we would suggest there's a potential, yes. So we need to develop the research. We need to change our language. That's our point two on the 10-point uh, plan. Number three is give immediate and necessary care. So as we're saying, you know, listen, what do the, does the patient want? And make sure every patient has access to evidence-based practice. So again, that's that research piece, that informed care that we're making. Increase access to the right products at the right time. Actively listen to patients and address systemic knowledge of staff. So if you are feeling like you need more information, Lindsay's mentioned so many different areas, educational platforms. Martin's sort of mentioned about um, going on to the TUC and Kira's mentioned about having um, the Oliver McGowan training that's available to, to all. And um, then we, but don't be afraid to escalate. So if you're not being given the time or you're not being given the support from your service managers or, you know, then you can escalate to ask if this, as Martin said, document it, write it down, make sure it's evident. And then of course, actively challenge the system and let's hopefully change the system for the better and you know putting personalized care at the forefront shared decision making and hopefully we'll have that equity that we all want to see for people with a learning disability and wound care um so just a, a quick sum of does anybody want to say a couple of words any last last minute things or do you think we've covered the majority of what people wanted to say kira is there anything anything from you that you wanted to um to i out? just want i just want to say after this evening, if anybody would like to contact me for further information or wants to know about MENCAP, or want to know more about learning disability, you'll find all my details. Joanne has them. So everybody in this group has my contact details. If, if anyone would like to speak to me, speak to the team here, get in touch. And I'm more than happy to have more conversations with people here. And I'm more happy, I'm happy to have conversations via email and phone and online. So if you want to talk to me after tonight, please get in touch. I'm happy to to talk um also please go and check out my podcast cheeky plug um, <laughs> all the details are on all the information that you were sent out to about tonight <laughs> i've listened to your podcast many times kira it's absolutely amazing and i highly recommend to everybody that's that's in the audience Lindsay, any any last minute questions any last minute statements from you no i think it's been fabulous to have kira here this evening giving us um, the the voice, lending her voice to the voices of people with learning disabilities. And I think she summed it up brilliantly. <laughs> Lovely. And uh, Martin, anything for you? I, I would just echo what Lindsay just said about Kira. It's great having somebody share their, their, music, their lived experiences with us all. Uh, all I would say is when, you've, when this is finished, carry on having the discussions in your workplaces and in your practices. Keep on talking about this. That's lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you to you all for being here. And of course, thank you to Flynn Health for sponsoring this event and supporting the Legs Matter Coalition for as long as they have. And, you know, the relationship is is um, is welcome. So thank you. The last thing I'd probably just like to say is that the Legs Matter website is accessible to everybody. Um, it's online. Um, I think something like www.legsmatter.co.uk. I'll probably go in the chat, something like that. But we do have action packs that you can download. Please go look at it. This webinar will be on our website soon. And it will get um, so be uploaded. Not today, it might be in the next couple of days, but uh, it will be there. And um, there's a lot of resources for you all looking at wound care um, on, on the Legs Matter website. Um, and please do look at our 10 point plan and help us in our mission, our campaign to try and you know, reduce the impact of harm uh, for patients living with lower limb and foot conditions. So that's a thank you from me and a good night. And uh, thank you to everybody in the room. So take care. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.